is it likely that you'll be doing any more comedy routine stuff? As well, we have one thing that you might qualify as a comedy routine that's built into the show right now. It's a new piece that hasn't been released yet. It's a combination of two songs. One of them is called Don't Eat the Yellow Snow. It's about uh, an Eskimo and his seal and an evil fur trapper. And, that, uh, and then the evil fur trapper um, has something terrible happen to him, and then he has to get repaired. And in order to get repaired, he seeks out, uh, well, he has to trudge across the tundra so that he can get to St. Alfonso's Parish at the juncture of the Columbia River Delta. And he has to seek out the representative of St. Alfonso, who is the patron saint of the smelt fishermen of Portuguese extraction. And uh, he has to find St. Alfonso's only authorized representative here on earth, Father Vivian Oblivion, man of the cloth. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and then uh, the two songs are Don't Eat the Yellow Snow and St. Alfonso's Pancake Breakfast. The music that you play, is it uh, heavily scored or is it largely uh, built around you know, pre-arranged patterns? 50% uh, of the things that we play are completely scored out up to and including all the beats that the drums are supposed to play. And uh, inside of those scored pieces, there are spaces left open for instrumental improvisation, much as you would in a normal jazz context. And the rest of the show is pieces that are either uh, so simple that you wouldn't bother to write them down, and you just hum them to the other musicians and they would pick it up, or else uh, they're completely improvised. We try during each show to improvise one piece 100%. To, to get musicians to play this sort of material, do you find it difficult at all? It's, it's one of the hardest things I ever had to do. Why? Because they're, they're not used to reading scores? No. Uh, you can always find musicians who can read, and there are plenty of very good reading musicians around, but you, the people that I like to find have to have these requisites. One, a sense of humor. Two, extreme musical ability in a legitimate sense. They should be able to manipulate their instrument with a great deal of proficiency and be able to read music because that saves time in learning how to play the stuff. And they also have to be able to feel some sort of uh, blues roots, you know, because most of the stuff that I've written, no matter how weird or complicated it might sound on top, it has some sort of rhythm and blues lurking in the background. And if the musician doesn't have some sort of uh, appreciation of that kind of music, then the performance doesn't come off right. Hey, what sort of blues, uh, you say blues roots, what sort of blues musicians have interested you? Well, my three favorite guitar players of all time are Johnny Guitar Watson, Guitar Slim, and Clarence Gatemouth Brown. And my favorite blues singers are uh, Little Willie John, and Howlin' Wolf, and Muddy Waters. Lightning and Slim. With uh, albums like Live at the Fulmore and Just Another Band from LA, have you ever had any censorship problems with what's on the albums? Um, well, the history of the Mothers of Invention has been fraught with censorship problems, and these result when uh, somebody has been employed by somebody else to determine what's best for the public at large, which I think is just a terrible job for anybody to have to live up to. But uh, the first company that we were signed with, MGM Verve, did some bad things to our albums, just randomly chopping things out that they didn't understand. That if they couldn't understand something, they presumed it to be uh, obscene, so they would cut it out. And that spoiled a lot of the, the work that we did for that label. So then we changed to uh, a special deal with uh, WEA, and we haven't had any censorship problems with them until I got to Australia and went to a press conference yesterday, and during the press conference they were playing some of our albums, and I noticed that the Uncle Meat album had been censored, and uh, they're not supposed to do that. Shouldn't, shouldn't be done. I also heard that the uh, Australian release of the soundtrack for 200 Motels has also been censored. And just to give you an idea of uh, the type of censorship that you're involved in, the only other countries in the world where 200 Motels have been censored are Spain, Portugal, and Brazil, so you you people are in trouble. You got to get rid of this censorship stuff. It's it's not going to do you any good at all. The stories in those particular two albums are, are they real stories? They're all true. Even the bit about the gremlin. That's true. The gremlin is true. Yeah. And the mud shark story. The mud shark story is true. For those of you who don't know what these stories are, you'll have to get the album and find out what he's talking about. If you do know, they're true. Really was a mud shark. There still are mud sharks. 
we have actually gone fishing for mud sharks ourselves at that same hotel. <laughs> Not only that, I have an interview on tape with the, uh, he was the desk clerk at this place. It's called the Edgewater Inn in Seattle, Washington. And I, I interviewed this man and asked him technical questions about how many mud sharks they find per week in the beds and you know who uses mud sharks and what do they use them for. And, and his answers were uh, sort of amazing because I presumed that sexual activities involving a, a large, rough-surfaced fish is a, sort of a thing that only a rock and roll group would get into. But he says, no, 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 that regular straight-life tourists also use mud sharks here at the hotel. Mater with material for pieces like um, the Mud Shark and, and Billy the Mountain and that, would they just come out of your day-to-day -day living and people sure. you meet in that? Yeah, well, I think that everybody who writes songs must extract what the, the text of his song from some personal experience. And it just so happens that the way I live my life and the people that I know give me access to types of experiences that are unusual by some standards. So I just write them down and try and share them with other people who may be interested in sharing those unusual experiences because maybe they don't have time to go to the Edgewater Inn and have fun with a mud shark. So we just, it's like helping the shut-ins, you know? What, uh, what first turned you on to the idea of the music that just started with Hot Rats, the Hot Rats album? Well, up until that time, the main drawback that that I could see with most of the Mother's albums prior to the Hot Rats album was the fact that the rhythm section didn't really get off the ground. You know, there, Jimmy Carl Black was okay as a drummer and Art Tripp was okay as a drummer and Billy Monday was okay as a drummer, but none of them were really, uh, you know, hard driving, you know, make you really want to tap your foot. And rather than fire them simply because they weren't hard driving because we'd all worked together for such a long time, I kept them around and you know, we're all good friends and we stayed in the band together, but I think the band suffered from lack of having a good beat. So the, my first venture into an album with a good beat was the Hot Rats thing, and at least 50% of what's on that album is foot-tappable material. And you're going to extend this idea further and further? Well, since the time that uh, the first group of mothers broke up, I've looked around for drummers that had foot-tapping ability. Ainsley Dunbar certainly had it in an abstract way. <coughs> and uh, Ralph Humphrey, the drummer that's with us now, certainly has it in an abstract way. Uh, you never know in the future I might get something that's even more basic and primitive. <laughs> Throbbing, lewd, pulsating rhythms. Are you going to have to listen to any of the Aboriginal music here in Australia? Depends on what the schedule is like. If, if today is any indication of what my schedule is going to be like, no, I won't get a chance to hear any of it. <laughs> Frank, uh, 200 motels is unlikely to be released here um, because of censorship requirements. You've got another film, Uncle Meat, uh, still on film and uncut. Is that likely to be edited? Uh, one day I might finish that, yeah. Well, have you any more film projects in mind? I want to make a science fiction movie. Any, any idea of a plot line for it? It has a giant spider in it and has a woman eight feet tall. It has a con man from the earth who's a religious fanatic. That's a musical. <laughs> right. The usual stuff, you know. <laughs> Regular, uh... Um, what, what about uh, Reuben and the Jets? You've got another Reuben and the Jets band on the road, although you're not closely associated with them personally. Uh, what are they doing at the moment? Uh, I believe they're touring with a group called Three Dog Night, and they're about to go to Europe probably in August. Are you keeping a very um, close eye on what they do or is it something? Well I advise them from time to time. I helped them get the group together and I produced their first album and uh, occasionally they have little intra-band squabbles and I sit there and act like a union mediator or something. <laughs> Arbitrator. <clears throat> what, what particularly, you know, what made you get a, a, the first Reuben and the Jets together? So, well, as I told you before, I always liked rhythm and blues music, and that's just another kind of rhythm and blues music. You know? Did you? Uh, there was some reportage around that uh, you were getting it together in an attempt to make a commercial success out of your music. <laughs> well, if you can imagine, in 1967, releasing well, it was recorded in 67 and released in 68. 
if you can imagine releasing an album like that and seriously thinking that that was going to be commercial, you'd see the humor in that statement. It's, you don't get very much airplay on top 40 stations. You don't get any at all as far as in Australia, and I wouldn't imagine you get terribly much overseas. Um, this is commercial success important to you, other than making enough money to do what you want to do? Well. Commercial success uh, represents two things. One, it represents dollars and cents, and two, it represents reaching a large audience. Um, the dollars and cents I'm comfortable with right now because I managed to make enough from the concert tours and so forth, publishing, uh, to pay for the equipment that I use and to pay the people who are making the music. <clears throat> but uh, the problem about reaching a larger audience is uh, it's important to me because more people know my face from a poster or from doing an interview on television or radio or magazine than have ever heard the albums or have ever seen the group live. You know, so it makes you wonder. I, I'm famous, but most people don't even know what I do. You've got a new album that will be released in the States fairly shortly. Can you tell us a bit about that? What sort of music we can expect on that? Sure. The name of the album is Overnight Sensation, and the cover of the album is a very unusual piece of artwork from a mathematical standpoint. If you like uh, perspective drawings, are you familiar with the work of Escher? Yes. Well, this takes Escher into a realm that you wouldn't even be able to compute. It's one of the most... I can't even describe where, you, where the viewer is seeing the album cover from. The guy who painted it is just a fantastic artist. And the scene that you're looking at is a still life that takes place in a Holiday Inn motel room. And visible on the outside is the Holiday Inn sign, and there are a number of objects in the foreground of symbolic significance, such as a pair of, well, I can't tell you, but uh, there's, it's a very intriguing album cover, folks. And uh, it has a grapefruit on it that's been ravaged, leaking some vile fluid from the side. And then uh, uh, there's a... Uh, there's a picture of our two roadies. Uh, there, <clears throat> there's one body sitting like this and two heads coming up <laughs> out of this. And one of the roadies is holding a nozzle from an enormous fire extinguisher with one glistening drop. His hand is in a holy gesture like that with this drop coming down. It's a nice album cover, really good. Uh, and the music inside of it uh, is quite a departure from the recent albums that we've put out because whether you like it or not, folks, I'm singing again. <laughs> and uh, most of the stuff on the album is vocal. There's only two instrumentals on there. They're short and they won't bother you. And uh, the, uh, we're also assisted by uh, Tina Turner and the Ikeettes, who are singing on there. Of all the, I'm not supposed to tell you that, but there they are. <laughs> <clears throat> Why the great, great fascination for holiday inns? Because when we tour in the United States, that's 90% uh, of the places that we stay in are holiday inns. They're everywhere. And so you know that if you go to a town, if you book into a holiday inn, you're guaranteed a certain mediocrity of performance that uh, you don't have to take chances on a flea bag hotel when you know you can have a plasticized one. <laughs> You know that every towel will be white with a green strip. <laughs> you know that every bench will be for mica. You know that uh, there will be a painting on the wall that has been mass produced from some secret schlock room in Nashville, Tennessee. That's probably, it's done on burlap and oh, on this cover, this is too inside folks, but I gotta tell you, there's a painting on the wall on this mythological motel room of, uh, well, every Holiday Inn in the United States has got one of these, at least one of these really groovy paintings on the wall, like a, it's about this wide and it's done on burlap and there's these brass bolts that hold it to the wall and then there's sort of an abstract picture of a Roman ruin or something, something romantic like that. And it's, like if your bed is here, it's on the wall over there so you can look at it just before you go to sleep. It's really horrible. But there's a, a painting in this scene of a window shade and that's it. It's, you know, done in the same style. The guy really captured the style of a Holiday Inn artwork and he painted a window shade. And not only that, every one of those horrible paintings in a Holiday Inn ha has the audacity to contain an artist's signature. <laughs> and one of the artist's signatures that I remember from one of those rooms was Brittany. 
spelled B-R-I-T-T-I-N-I with a big B that's stretched out like that and, you know, really fancy script, and it occupies approximately one-eighth of the total area of the painting. <laughs> As if the guy was so proud that he has just painted this schlocked-up Grecian ruin, you know. So anyway, we have a painting of a window shade that says Brittany in the corner on the wall over there. Alice Cooper draws a lot of his inspiration, if you can call it that, uh, from television. What particular aspects of American life and Americanas, other than Holiday Inns, intrigue you? Well, I uh, don't want anybody to get the idea that I'm a Holiday Inn fetishist by any stretch of the imagination. I just brought that up because it was germane to our album cover. But uh, I watch television every once in a while, and uh, some things that I've seen on television have enthused me to the point of writing songs about them. St. Alfonso's Pancake Breakfast has some, is derived from a television commercial in the United States. I'll tell you about it. <laughs> There's a margarine in the United States called Imperial Margarine, and they have this commercial that is in such bad taste that makes you want to die every time <laughs> it comes on. There's a young black gentleman sitting in a bed, and he's just woken up, and he's got his covers up like this, and then his young girlfriend comes trudging into the room. She's carrying a tray. She walks in, and, and he goes, Oh, boy, pancakes and butter. And she says, Good morning, Your Highness. No, it's not butter. And as soon as she says, Your Highness, this crown appears on his head. It goes, ding, like that. <laughs> and, and he takes a big mouthful of these pancakes and <laughs> starts shoveling it in. and go, mmm, this really tastes better than butter. You know, it's, God, it's horrible. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it, we, we used to see that two or three times a night watching science fiction movies that would come on and I would just roll all over the couch, you know, just loathsome. So it turned into a song.